Okay. So I will get feedback on your news releases as by tomorrow at the latest before we come back to class Thursday. Um, and what you should do between now and Thursday is, you know, simply read what's on the Moodle page about the recorded music industry and maybe work on your study guide. Um, today, we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is the news. Um, I used to be a newspaper reporter. And even though I don't do that anymore as a PR professor, uh, I'm still very interested in the news. I'm a big um, avid consumer of the news. And so this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. If you're not a big fan of the news, hopefully you'll develop that since you're probably somewhat related in the media. We just may be different fans of different media or mediums. What big a news event is happening tonight? What? Yeah, there's a debate. The first debate between Trump and Biden. And uh, I don't know what it's going to be like, but um, I'm going to probably tune in and watch it. And if I get bored, I'll tune out. Um, but it's the first presidential debate between these two guys. And the elections, something like 40 days away. It's not very far. So after reading chapter six, these are all of the different things a book says you should learn. Um, you should be able to, to define news. Uh, before we get to a slide that defines it for us, how do you define news? Oh, you were just moving in. Are you raising your hand? Think about it. Think about it. Oh, well, speak out of if you want to, but not trying to pressure you. Um, it should help you to know there is no universally accepted definition of news. So you can look up in a dictionary, there probably is a term, but I mean, in the industry, there's not one definition that covers it because it's so broad and so vast. Um, David Brinkley, who was a longtime ABC reporter, who isn't one anymore, I'm not even sure if Mr. Brinkley is still alive, but he famously said one time, news is what I say it is, which is kind of arrogant, right? Did you want to say something? Oh, God. Okay. Uh, but it's also kind of true. He was, he worked for ABC News and he and his colleagues decided what to put on the air every day. And so on one level, the reporters are the gatekeepers. News is something that should be relevant to our lives, something that is timely, just happened. If it's something that happened five days ago, it's old news, it's not news. Um, and it should be have proximity to us. So something that happens in Cape matters to us more than something that maybe happens somewhere else. Um, and so news is something that we all care about, whether or not we believe that we do. Um, when we first came to America, uh, on ships, and then ships would come into port, people would literally run to the docks to get the newspapers or whatever came over and find out what was happening in Europe. So people used to really yearn for the news. We don't yearn for it as much today because it's everywhere. You know, you could be right now looking, you know, taking notes for class, and in another window you could have a news uh, feed up or it's on your phone or uh, you really can, almost can't get away from the news in today's society. So we maybe don't yearn for it the way we used to, but if we lost it, we would, I think, because everyone wants to know what's going on. This book um, talks about the factors that contribute to something being newsworthy. Uh, James Gordon Bennett is a really important name. I'm pretty sure he's on your study guide. He was... Um, kind of a pioneering journalist who tried, uh, who sort of 
help define what journalism is. We're gonna talk a little bit more about him. But that's an important name to remember. He actually has um, components of a model he talks about, we'll discuss. Um, the Hutchins Commission on US Journalism was an important group that kind of studied the field of journalism. We'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, and you can kind of read this on your own, but these, these are kind of the important things that we should know. Um, what are news holes and how do they affect how news is distributed? Um, Nonstop news coverage. You guys are too young to remember when we didn't have the 24 seven news stations. Uh, it was around 1979, 1980. I didn't look up the date, but around that period of time that Ted Turner decided he was gonna start a 24 seven hour day, seven day a week, 24 hour news station called CNN. Everybody laughed at him. And they're like, no one's gonna watch the news 24 seven. And sure enough, it became a hit. And then a lot of people mimicked that. Now we have Fox News, we have MSNBC, we have multiple ESPN sports news channels. And so, well, on some level that's been good for news, it's also had some negative effects on news. Having news just nonstop, it's changed things. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Okay, I'll click this real quick. I heard somebody else come in. Alec, I'm gonna write you down. I, I have you as absent. He came in after I took the roll. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So your book starts on the very first page of chapter six, talking about Donald Trump in the news. Um, I think they did that because he's been a larger than life figure ever since he got elected in 2016. And he's had this kind of love hate relationship with the media. Um, he's a public official who cries fake news for everything. And uh, yet he, will say really bombastic things to the media, sometimes just to get coverage. Um, and he is very media savvy, even though sometimes if I was his PR person, I'd say, please don't tweet that. If I was his PR person, I'd take his phone away and I wouldn't let him tweet. I would probably tweet for him or something because he, he gets a lot, in a lot of trouble when he does that. Um, but the book kind of points out and he's this larger than life figure who also kind of was at war with the media. I don't know if you guys remember during the 2016 campaign or not, but during one of the debates, Megyn Kelly of Fox News was the questioner. And uh, she brought up questions that he didn't like them, so he called her names. He even was very, I'm not trying to say this because I'm not trying to take sides, but there's no other way to, to describe his comments, but sexist, because he referred to, he said something along the lines, these weren't the exact words, you're asking me these mean questions because you must be having your period. He referred to her, you know, her cycle. That's pretty sexist in the 21st century. So he had this kind of ongoing fight with Megyn Kelly. It's kind of interesting because Megyn Kelly was kind of a rising star or big star at Fox News. And uh, Fox News was kind of, at least um, their managing editor, Roger Ailes was a big Trump fan. Mr. Ailes has since passed away. Um, but they kind of use him as an example of uh, sort of a big person in the news. And one of the values of news is uh, celebrity or people who are out of the ordinary, maybe the notoriety of the person. For instance, I remember when Bill Clinton was president, uh, he got a dog and it was all over the news. The president gets a dog. 
And um, some people joked because it was after the Monica Lewinsky stuff or during it that, you know, Bill needed a friend. So he went out and got a dog. Um, what's interesting about that is if I went out today and got a dog, it would not make the newspaper. But the president got a dog, so it makes a newspaper. So famous people sometimes are news just because they're famous. So the concept of news. News has changed through the years in terms of its delivery and sometimes its style, maybe even how it's defined. But news is still an attempt to inform the public about their community. Um, so a definition of news that I would give that again, there's, it's not broad enough. That's the problem with there's no universally, this one sentence tells you what news is, but it's an attempt to inform the public about the important goings on of the day. It involves, um, celebrities or well-known personalities, things that are in proximity to you things that are unusual. And this information is designed to make people better citizens or better informed. Um, when I was a reporter, people used to always call the paper if you had a negative story. And they're like, why don't you ever run any good stories? Well, the truth is we did, we did it all the time. But we actually did a little study. It was not scientific like I might be today as a professor. Well, we kind of looked at our newspaper and we realized we had more positive than negative stories. But if you have a negative story about a murder or you have a negative story about a scandal, that's going to be remembered more than a Boy Scout got a trophy or, you know, a pastor at a church gets a community honor. So some of the good stories that we would run aren't the ones that would stick in your mind. And so the negative stories um, would stay and leave a, a lasting impact. Um, so news is not really positive or negative though. It is just what it is. It's something that's relevant to your audience and to your readers. And as a newspaper person, you kind of use the reader as the yardstick. Do my readers need to know this? Do my need or are my readers interested in this? And if the answer to those questions are yes, then you probably put it in the paper. How has news changed? What do you guys think? The book talks about this quite a bit. News as change. What's that mean? I think it became more like a freelance story rather than like five or the actual like news that people like maybe need to hear because it's more like for example. Like, Okay. Yeah, how we cover the news has changed quite a bit. Um, with the internet has come a sense of, you know, an hour ago was too late. Uh, so I practiced journalism in the 1980s, 90s. And, um, you know, I worked, I worked a lot for weekly papers, but if you worked at a daily, Usually you put the paper to bed and then the next morning you start it all over again. Well, the news isn't something that has a 24 hour cycle now, thanks to Ted Turner and the internet and other things. You know, something that happens an hour from now needs to be covered sometimes depending upon what it is. Um, and so how we have uh, covered news has changed and how we reported it. And the internet has given us a tremendous capacity to update. So let's say at 10 o'clock this morning, we found out that there had been a body discovered, but we didn't know much more. But at 11 o'clock, the body's been identified and you can say who it is. So the next hour, you can update it. So one thing that the news can do today is update stories. News also can bring about change, which is what I was kind of getting at, but I, um, Sometimes news can be a change agent. And we saw that in the civil rights movement, that there were heroic newspapers that covered stories, but they also, sometimes they had an editor that would write an opinion piece 
um, about the atrocities of the civil rights um, violations that were occurring at the hands of police and other authorities. And so news can change society by keeping people informed. Before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, one of the things that he believed in the civil rights movement tried to do was, okay, we'll have these nonviolent protests, we'll ride buses, we'll do different things to kind of protest how we're being treated. But they knew if they did it in front of television cameras where pictures of them being beaten and hosed by different people, you know, they would literally turn fire hoses on them. Um, that the pictures of that would bring about change on people in middle America who knew, you know, hurting African Americans was wrong, but it you know, wasn't next door, it wasn't in their community and they didn't have to think about it. But once it was piped into their homes on the evening news, it made them uncomfortable. They finally had to do something about it. And so news can change society. Matter of fact, I think it's doing that today uh, with all the different protests that are going on. Would anybody, um, that's not properly phrased. Would as many people have cared about the person who the policeman sat on his neck and choked him to death if that had not been videoed and seen all over the place. Um, some people might have found out and some people might have cared, but it also might have been hidden and there might have been a cover up, but for somebody taking a picture of it and us being able to see it on our television. So news can bring about big change. Newsworthiness, I already kind of told you what my test was. Do my readers need to know this? Do my readers want to know this? So your readers are kind of your yardstick. And it's very subjective. What I might think is newsworthy is not what other people might think is newsworthy. So it's not like math where you can put five plus five and get 10, but this is very kind of more art than science in terms of what you pick as news. I remember a very shocking thing that I grew up in Rolla, Missouri. And when I was a junior or senior in high school, I don't remember which, one of my friends, I was, I uh, played sports in high school. We were on sport teams together. Um, one day her dad dropped her off to school and then went to work and there was an accident at work and he was killed. And um, he was brought out, there was a, an accident and he was brought out and kind of laid down and the paramedics were trying to revive him. And the photographer for the Rolla Daily News got from a photographic stance, wonderful photographs of them trying to revive him. But then he dies. Rolla is a very small town at the time. I lived there, there were about 13,000 people. I think it's a little bigger today. That night or the next morning, whenever the paper uh, covered the story, they had a sprawling picture of Mr. Allison dead on the ground and them trying to revive him above the fold, across, you know, as if it was the Kennedy assassination. And it was a newsworthy event. And it was a terrific photograph. If you measure it by, um, he was there, he caught the picture, he, the essence of what was going on. But I knew the family. I'm, I'm just a high school student at this point. I'm not on the newspaper or anything. It devastated them. And they literally drove from newspaper machine to newspaper machine and just ripped them all up so people couldn't see their dead dad on the cover of the next newspaper. And the only reason I tell this story today is, was that newsworthy? If you use my yardstick, do my readers need to know this? The answer is probably yes. A major accident and somebody in our small town died. Do they want to know this? Yes. But do they need to know it 
in that kind of dramatic form or could a story have sufficed? I would have put the story above the fold, probably the most important thing that happened that day. It happened at the University of Missouri Rolla um, on their grounds because he worked there. Uh, there was no foul play, nothing like that. It was just a tragic accident. But I'm just curious, would you guys have played the, and I'm trying not to, I probably already have set it up to where you, can, you feel like you can't agree with me. Would you have played the photograph that big and like that? What would have been your newsworthy test? You say, no, why wouldn't you have played it up? The photographer, you know, for the matter of fact, the whole town was mad at the newspaper. Um, I suspect a lot of people, though, read the story because the picture was there. And the photographer defended himself. He said it was news. He died at an accident at work, the biggest employer in the city, and it was news. What else do you guys think? I confess I'm biased because I was friends with his daughter. But I probably would not have run it had I been the editor because the story would have sufficed and the picture was a tragic, uh, it just was like piling on. Uh, the story itself would also be hard, but um, it just seemed to, seemed like overkill for a small town. Now I'm not saying I would never show some of something that's tragic, but there are different circumstances. Um, so anyway, sometimes you have to ask other questions for your newsworthiness. Yes, they needed to know the accident occurred. Yes, they wanted to know, but what are the other ramifications if I run this? And so, there are balancing acts between if I run this story, how much, or in this case, a photograph, how much damage does it do to other people? And so sometimes you hold things. Um, on 9-11, there was a kind of a debate and controversy over whether or not to show pictures of people jumping out the windows, the people that were in the towers before they fell, some of them, were about to burn up, they had nowhere to go, and they made the decision to jump out the window rather than be burned alive. And some news organizations would not show them, and some did. Um, that to me is a little different because you could not see and recognize the people. It did show the impact of the tragedy. I don't know, I don't know exactly what I would have done um, but to me, that's just a little bit different because that was a global tragedy and you couldn't identify the person. Um, so maybe I would in that case, I don't know. I don't know if I would show live footage of it, but maybe a snapshot. But these are the kind of things that are difficult to kind of um, resolve and that's why they're very subjective to so James Gordon Bennett um, basically was a printer and he started a newspaper that was part of the penny press movement of the 1830s. And he came up with a lot of interesting ideas that today are part of the modern newsroom um, in terms of his model of news became very, very deadline driven um, because um, they were able to do things more deadline driven. Um, for instance, you know, in the 1700s, um, the sort of the revolutionary period of the press, you know, the news was sometimes timely, but sometimes it was months old. They would take it from news they got off ships and things like that. But Bennett basically wanted reporters to go and cover things 
and he wanted them to be deadline driven. One of the things that James Gordon Bennett um, insisted upon, which remains today, is the notion of objective journalism. That he thought that people did not want to read everybody's opinion. Uh, and so just the facts, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And sometimes some of the critics to Bennett's model kind of said that that made reporting kind of robotic. It's just kind of like who, what, when, and then there wasn't a lot of action to it or that kind of thing. And in fact, because of that, often the reporters kind of seemed kind of veiled. The reporters seemed like they weren't even real people. They were kind of like, they wouldn't have said robots in his day because they probably didn't even think about them, but they were sort of almost mechanical, if you will. Um, some of the flaws with his model was that the rush to meet a deadline sometimes caused them to have superficial stories that weren't quite ready for print and they printed them anyway. That's one of the big problems that have happened with 24 seven news stations is that the urgency to get stuff on the air constantly, sometimes people rush to news without, excuse me, without confirming everything. The notion of the Bennett model sometimes can be kind of dull. Other reporters and other journalism of the day was often inserting opinions and they were sometimes flamboyant with the things that they said. So by comparison, objective news seemed dull. Sometimes too, they, they might not probe certain questions because they just didn't have time. They had to make their deadline. And so investigative journalism, if you will, takes a long time. Um, most people have heard of Watergate, but most people don't realize it took Woodward and Bernstein a couple of years to unveil that story, that they began covering it when the burglary happened. And then over time, they would piece by piece by piece find a story. And then over time, everybody kind of figured out what it was, but it wasn't something that happened overnight. And if you're in a rush and you're not taking a big picture look at things, sometimes you might miss a trend or something like that. Manipulation, this I found interesting in the book. Um, Theodore Roosevelt was a masterful president at manipulating the news. And you can still kind of do this today depending upon the, the news outlet and, and that kind of thing. But Theodore Roosevelt realized that, and again, this was at a time when, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I'm actually interested in my lecture. I'm just, guess I'm tired. I apologize for yawning at you guys. Um, during Theodore Roosevelt's time, you know, newspaper go to press in the morning or the evening, but they, they weren't around 24 seven. And so often on Monday morning, reporters didn't have much to write about because the week had kind of, they'd gone through the week and then the weekend and they showed up Monday and they were looking for stories. So Theodore Roosevelt figured that out. So he would release statements or news he wanted into the press on Sunday. So it would make the Monday paper. And so he knew exactly how to manipulate the press into covering his stories. And sometimes, you know, the press would fall for that. If the president says something, it's news because the president says something. There's a case study in your book about Joseph McCarthy. And I suspect in your history classes, your political science classes, uh, somewhere you've heard a lot about Joseph McCarthy. Um, he was a senator who became very famous in the 1950s by claiming there were communists everywhere in America. And to understand McCarthy, in part, you have to understand that in 1950s, there were two superpowers. There was America and there was Russia. And they were vying for really control of the world, if you will. America was democratic 
and uh, uh, Russia was communist. And they both wanted their worldview to prevail over the other. And so America was very scared of communism. And um, we also were very much afraid after World War II and America used um, nuclear bombs on Japan, we were very afraid as a country that if anybody else got them and used them on us, that'd be end of America. And it was not an unreasonable thought that nuclear weapons couldn't annihilate the earth. And so in the 1950s, people were really afraid. They were building bomb shelters in their backyard and they were um, just doing all kinds of things. And the fear of communism was so great that all I had to do if I was living back then was say so-and-so was a communist and it'd be enough to ruin you. So McCarthy used this issue to try to get attention. And um, for a while, he kind of got away with it. He made a very famous speech where he had an envelope and he said, in this envelope I have, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like something like 200 members of the Communist Party who work at the State Department. And he put in his coat jacket. He didn't have any names. It was all a lie, but the press wrote it down and they did news stories about it. And eventually over time, he kept uh, insinuating, uh, he attacked kind of the movie industry as being communist. He attacked the military. When he attacked the military as being communist, that's when President Eisenhower stepped in and said, no more, you're not gonna call the military communist. And he kind of stepped in and um, a lot of people thought he should have done it sooner. Edward R. Murrell went after McCarthy. Have any of you guys seen Good Night and Good Luck? Very good movie. Uh, but it's about how Edward R. Murrell kind of took on McCarthy and exposed him. So over time, when people kept saying, okay, you have this envelope, show us the names, and he didn't have any, and then the number kept changing. He would go from like 200 to 50 to 10. And so his story wasn't consistent. It was a very fearful time in America and a lot of lives were ruined. A lot in the movie industry. And there are a lot of good movies about that as well. And so one thing you can take from the study of this that you can read more about in your book is that reporters probably should not have reported wild allegations without any you know, substance, and he got away with that for a very long time. Everybody was afraid of him. Any questions? Well, the Hutchins models. There was a committee that was headed by Robert Hutchins that was asked to kind of examine news and see what it was, you know, how it was doing and that kind of thing. And Hutchins uh, made some recommendations and some people, Henry Luce, who was the publisher of Life uh, Magazine, Time Magazine, didn't like what Hutchins had to say, but Hutchins kind of agreed with the notion of objective journalism. And um, he was, it was very influential what he had to say um, about that. Luce didn't necessarily agree with him. Television and the internet changed news forever. Uh, television had been around a little bit, but by 1948, television really burst into the popular culture in America and the ma vast majority of homes have a television set. And so being able to see as well as hear the news changed it a great deal. Um, it came into your home and people were, in the beginning, they were really kind of mesmerized by it. Um, the internet, we talked a little bit about that when we talked about, you know, the internet and some other chapters, but the fact that News is instantaneous on the internet, has changed a lot of things, some for the good, some for the bad. The fact you can find something out almost instantly is good, but it's not as fact check as it used to be sometimes. 
And the notion is, well, we can just correct it if we're wrong. The problem is, yeah, you can. The story goes out at 11.30 and it's wrong and you correct it at 11.35. There are people who've seen it in that five bit period and they're not gonna see the correction. So the internet and television really changed news dynamics. It's, it's more about fast. There was a TV station in Nashville I used to watch too and their model was first, fast, accurate. And I would submit to you that's what TV and internet has done wrong to the news business. First, fast, accurate. Backwards. Um, I wanted to always scoop people too, so I liked being first. Um, but first and foremost, you should be accurate, fast, and first when you can be. And so I think on some level, TV and the internet has changed the priorities of news. Because you can become a pretty famous journalist if you're successful on TV. Um, there have been a lot of new platforms and dynamics brought into the news business as a result of the in internet. Um, we still have a lot of printed news dailies, uh, but we have a lot more one town newspapers than we used to. Um, a lot of news, you know, news towns would have one or two newspapers. A big city like New York would have a ton, but now we have a lot of places that have one town um, papers like Rolla Daily News, where I grew up, there's one paper. Many years ago, somebody tried to start a competing paper, but it didn't survive. Also, some little towns don't have papers anymore. I think I've told you in this class before that my great grandfather was a publisher of a newspaper in Perry, Kansas, and that town doesn't have a newspaper anymore. I don't even know how many people live in Perry, Kansas. It's not named for my family, it's just a coincidence. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I would say fewer than 3,000 people live there. So they can't sustain a newspaper. So they probably take their paper from maybe Wichita or Lawrence or some surrounding bigger city. So audiences are more fragmented than they've ever been before. Um, and there's new opportunities and challenges related to being able to target those fragmented audiences. Um, and hybrid reporting, uh, part of what that means is that there are people who will go out and maybe they'll shoot a story for the KV, K, KFES and shoot some film, but then they'll also, maybe they'll do um, some web content for it, or maybe they'll do a podcast in addition to a news story. And so there's a lot of different models where Rarely will a reporter just go out and report and do a story with a picture. Usually there's other formats and ways to use the information. I'm curious, where do you guys get your news? I'm assuming you watch some or absorb some. Yeah. Okay. Who else? I like podcasts too. Um, and I do what I kind of preach. I believe in media literacy. So I will watch a little bit of Fox News, a little bit of MSNBC, a little bit of CNN. Um, I will watch, but I, I really kind of like PBS in terms of being objective. I think it's one of the more objective news sources like the PBS News Hour. I don't read as much news as I used to and that probably that probably makes me a little bit of a hypocrite. Um, but I do get quite a bit of news off the web as well. When I can, I do on Sunday, I like to watch Meet the Press um, or This Week with George Stephanopoulos. So I have several shows I like. In the morning when I get up, kind of digressing here, I get up and get ready to come to work. From five to eight, there's a news program called Morning Joe. And um, it features Joe Scarborough, who was a Republican congressman, who now he's the Morning Joe. And he's got people from 
all perspectives on the show. He's got liberals and conservatives and people in between, and they talk about the news of the day. And I like it because he is a Republican conservative um, commentator. He was a member of Congress. His co-host is very liberal. And then they have a third kind of co-host who's in between. And I, I guess I like shows that show all perspectives. So I really like that show. And it's also one of the few shows that I have recommended to friends. And not all my friends and I agree on politics because that's not, for me, that's not some kind of litmus test. You must believe like me or you can't be my friend. And so sometimes they're like, oh, I don't know. And then they watch it and they're like, that's a great show. So it's, it's really a pretty good news program in the morning. I kind of listen to it as I'm getting ready to come to work. Um, what are some of the values? So if news judgment is subjective and we've already kind of talked about that, what are some things that reporters or journalists value um, and that would impact how they would cover stories and, and what stories they would cover? What are some values you think journalists have? Accuracy. Um, good ones want to get the story right. There probably are some out there that just want to get the ratings or just want to get people to buy the newspaper or whatever. And there might be some out there that don't care about accuracy, but I would consider them not journalists then. <laughs> if you want to cover a story and you don't care if it's true, you're not really a reporter, you're something else. That doesn't mean that reporters are always accurate, but they should always strive to be. Um, they value, at least American ones, they value democracy and how it works. And they see themselves as a pivotal part of democracy. Um, we haven't talked too much about this, but you know we have three branches of government. We have the executive branch, which is the presidency and kind of like, his cabinet, so the administrative branch. There's a judicial branch, which is the courts, and there's a legislative branch, which is Congress. Um, and often the press is referred to as the fourth estate or the fourth branch of government because they keep the other three branches in check. They, they serve a, a watchdog role. And so that'd be one thing they value. Journalists, at least in theory, I know this isn't always practice, but they believe in fairness. Uh, and so sometimes when they go after stories um, in support of the little guys, because they're trying to you know, bring about some kind of fairness. There's some personal values. Um, you know, basically part of what journalism is supposed to be is about inclusiveness of all people in the community. And so journalists need to be aware of everyone and have diversity in their coverage and diversity in their stories. Um, I think a lot of studies have shown that there's kind of a color bias in the media where often um, they're, they're kind of colorblind because journalism, there are exceptions to this, but percentage wise, there are not a lot of African Americans and minorities in journalism, although there, there are some. But part of it is it's kind of a rough lifestyle for them for different reasons. The profession is not welcoming. Again, there are lots of exceptions to that. But as a result, journalists tend to do stories about people just like them. And so there's been a real movement really since the 90s to try to make sure that reporters cover stories about everyone in the community. They care about democracy and capitalism. Um, they do care about individualism as long as it's kind of tempered by the greater good. Uh, you want what's best for everybody. They care about social order. So, you know, they, they that doesn't mean that people can't protest and it doesn't mean that um, people can't you know, non-violently, you know, protest what the government does, but they do kind of 
want there to be social order. Most reporters are not trying to cover stories so that they can oust the president or oust the governor or oust the mayor. And the watchdog function is really, really important. Uh, you know, there's this terrible stereotype about journalists in American society, and they probably deserve some of it. Um, but journalism practice at its best form is a watchdog. They're watchful of government to make sure that they're functioning the way they're supposed to. And if anyone in government steps out of line, they bark. And so, you know, and that kind of gets them to go back in line. They're not supposed to be lap dogs or they're too friendly with government, or they're not supposed to be attack dogs where they just attack um, for no reason. There was a period in post Watergate journalism where people thought, you know, I can make my reputation. All I have to do is bring somebody down. I wanna be Woodward and Bernstein. I wanna bring people down. Well, that's not what journalism is about either. Woodward and Bernstein, when they took on the Watergate story had no idea that they were gonna cause the first president in American history to resign from office. They didn't know it was gonna go that high. And so watchdog, not lapdog or not attack dog. Um, and we're better off for that because sometimes power does corrupt people. And so if your government steps out of line or government official steps out of line, journalists are actually doing us you know, a service if they warn us about that. So these values help shape the news. A news hole is basically a spot in the paper or in your program if it's broadcast where you don't have a story. Maybe you have, if it's a newspaper, maybe you have your um, page one story all the way through, but page nine, you have nothing. So you talk about, okay, I've got a 12 inch hole on this page, what am I gonna fill it with? And so um, sometimes, depending upon the news cycle, you might have so much information that you have to pull things from it. Um, but the news hole is basically the function of making sure everything in the paper or everything in your 30 minute broadcast is full. You don't wanna have two second, you know, two minutes of air because you didn't have a story. Um, and news flow, it depends upon, again, the outlet, but generally, you know, reporters will seek stories. They'll check in with their editors and then the stories are uh, submitted Then they're edited, they're fact checked. Then they'll go to somebody who puts them on a paper and then somebody proofreads them. And so by the time a story goes in the paper or on the news, generally speaking, a lot of different people have um, looked at it or observed it and, and helped cut down any potential mistakes. Although as we know, a lot of mistakes do end up in the news in part because it's hard to get every single fact correct in every single story for everything you do. Um, because sometimes people don't tell you the truth and people don't want you to find out the truth. And the, the case of the Watergate scandal, you know, the president's administration lied over and over and over and over again. Not everybody in his administration, but so it's, it's sometimes it's really hard to get the news. This day and age, because of economics, there are fewer people working at newspapers than there used to be. There have been um, fewer reporters at newspapers, but they still have the same news hole to cover. Sometimes they'll reduce the size of the paper. And so staffing has created kind of a problem due to economics. The book talks quite a bit about the Penn State scandal. Who can tell me what the Penn State scandal is kind of in like a sentence? Big news when it happens. Anybody? Well, Penn State had been a very, very, very uh, good football program for many years. 
uh, under Papa Joe, I'm going to forget his name now, Joe, uh, uh, and you guys remember his name, they called him Papa Joe. Well, he was the head football coach. And he was something like 80, and he was still coaching. And he was very, very popular because one of the things that he did was he really encouraged his players, not just to be good football players, but he encouraged them to make sure that they finished college so they would have something to do when their football career was over. And he won a lot of championships and was one of the winningest coaches in their division. One of his assistant coaches, uh, who I can't even, he may have been a volunteer assistant coach, I can't quite remember now, um, but he, and he'd also retired. Uh, turns out that that man, not the big coach, but that man had molested children, sometimes in the locker room at Penn State football. And the allegation was that the football program kind of knew, but they didn't take it very seriously and they didn't report it. And this went on for years. And there was an incident where another kind of lower level kind of coach saw this guy, I think his name was Jerry, saw Jerry in the showers one day with a kid. Now, I don't think that they were undressed or anything, but it just looked weird. So that person re reported it to Papa Joe, who called some officials at the school. And then once he reported it, he didn't think anything about it. It turns out that there were pretty serious allegations and a lot of kids came forward and said, this happened to me. It wasn't just one or two. And so when it, it kind of bit by bit got revealed that the football program should have done something more rigorous um, and so it was this huge scandal. Um, and there was a reporter who kind of stuck with the story until it became big news. Um, he was so popular at first, the, the big coach, that some, some news organizations weren't really covering it um, until it kind of became kind of undeniable that something had happened. And so it's an interesting case study. I invite you to read it in the book. Um, to know about it a little bit more. Audience expectations is a big one, especially with news. It, it is with newspapers too, but um, how many of you guys know who Rachel Maddow is? Anybody? Okay. She is a person who has a um, news commentary show on MSNBC at night, I don't know if she's on seven, eight or nine. I watch her sometimes, I think she's very smart. Um, she kind of burst into the TV culture at the same time that Bill O'Reilly and other men on Fox were really, really popular. The O'Reilly Factor and Sean Hannity. And she kind of, in some ways, kind of came out of left field because there weren't a lot of women who had their own primetime news shows. Um, but she was smart and she was, she, one time she was, uh, filling in on meet the press for the normal moderator, uh, cause he couldn't be there. And that, that's one of the best episodes of meet the press I ever got. Cause nobody got away with uh, evading her questions. And so she was kind of one of the first women to break through and be, uh, nationally known. You may not like the politics. Uh, but I think the fact that she kind of broke through kind of an old boys network or whatever uh, makes her kind of stand out. Now there's quite a few women, that, you know, in prime time with a news show. Um, Megan Kelly had one for a while. I don't know if she was in prime time or not. Uh, she's she kind of had a falling out with Fox News, I think. But um, she she had her own show for a while. Competition really still impacts the news business a lot because they're constantly competing with who can be first and who, and, and if you're first more often, maybe you're gonna win, maybe people are gonna turn into your station or they're gonna read your newspaper. One thing that some people started doing was to kind of tag along with the police so that they could get stories as they unfold. 
think that's a good place to stop for today. I'm going to, I think I'll turn off the recording and I'll come clean the seats. But does anybody have a question before we go? Okay, folks at home, you can take off if you want to. I'm gonna let me stop the recording.